morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Still a little bit morning yet. Ten of twelve. So good to see all your smiling faces here today. I was just sitting there, and by the way, that song I heard it before, but never arranged like that. It was very, very beautiful. Um, if you could open up in your bulletin, you have this little paper here. This is a pretty good read here for you to put together. So I just want to start by reading it. The Sabbath, as a memorial of God's creative power, points to Him as the maker of the heavens and the earth. Hence, it is a constant witness to His existence and a reminder of His greatness, His wisdom, and His love. There could never have been an atheist. Had the Sabbath always been sacredly observed, there could never have been an atheist or an idolater. Isn't that an amazing statement? Wow. The Sabbath institution, which originated in Eden, is as old as the world itself. It was observed by all the patriarchs from creation down. During the bondage in Egypt, the Israelites were forced by their taskmasters to violate the Sabbath. And to a great extent, they lost the knowledge of its sacredness. When the law was proclaimed at Sinai, the very first words of the fourth commandment were, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Showing that the Sabbath was not, was not then instituted, we are pointed back for its origin to creation. In order to obliterate God from the minds of men, Satan aimed to tear down this great memorial. Much like what's happening in the world today with memorials, huh? If men could be led to forget their creator, they would make no effort to resist the power of evil, and Satan would be sure of his prey. It's an amazing statement. I want you to hold on to this piece of paper, right? And just close it like this, so that you have a blank sheet to write on. Because we may need this a little later. Okay? I want to ask you, do you desire Jesus? Do you desire Jesus? How much do you desire Jesus? Is your refuge in God true? Is it? And how do you know? How do you know? How is your life actions? Let's turn to Isaiah. 53. I think we hit that here this morning. It says, Isaiah 53. When you get there, you say, Amen. Amen. Look. Beginning in verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. No beauty that we should desire him. Hmm. So he's just common, right? He looks like anybody else. So what is it about Jesus that you're drawn to? Because it says there's nothing there that would cause you to desire him. Right? So why do you desire him? His love? His character? Okay. He is despised and rejected of men, verse 3, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Does this sound like desire? Doesn't sound like much desire to me. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, 
Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? All we like sheep, the Bible says, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Where is or what is practical Christianity today, brothers and sisters? Where do you find it? Do you find it in your life? Do you find it in Bible reading? Do you find it in coming to church? Do you find it in prayer? Do you find it in worship? I want you to take that piece of paper that I asked you to hold on to and, and, and fold up so that you have and I want you to write down the, the number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay? And what I want you to do with this piece of paper is I don't want you to take a lot of time with this. Okay? I want you to list 10 desires, your biggest desires. And I don't, they don't need to be in order. Okay? Because if you sit there, if you think too hard about this, you're not being honest. All right? I just want you to write down your 10 biggest, and they don't need to be in a, the matter of importance. Just write 10 down. Go ahead, everybody get it. I think this may be interesting to some of us, what we find that we write down. Finding it easy to, to write down 10 things that we desire? It should be, right? You would think. 10 things? Pretty simple. I think Jesus had a lot of desire to save us, didn't he? To go through all that he went through. He didn't give himself for a moment in time. Jesus gave himself to us forever. Forever. In eternity. Y'all get that 10? Should be pretty simple. You need a few more minutes? Desire. How strong a word is that? Desire. How much do you desire? What do you desire? Hmm. All right. You guys got the 10? <laughs> I see that shaking no. I'm saying yes. All right. We can't spend forever on this, so. I want you to take the list of 10 that you have, or however many you got now, and I want you to list the importance. So whatever number you have them in, I want you on the right side to write on the, the, the list that you have, what is most important that you desire on that list. And I want you to write one, two, one being most important. And this isn't for anybody else. Nobody's going to quiz you on. This is for you yourself. Okay? That's, I'm not asking anybody what their list is. This is for you guys. Personally. All right. Now I want to ask you, do we merely have feelings for Jesus? 
Do we just have feelings for Jesus? Well, you know, I, how, how strong are your feelings for Jesus? Would you say that you truly, truly desire Jesus? I mean, when you're looking at your list now, just each, each one, not everybody looking at anybody else's list, when you're looking at that list and you ask yourself, would you say that you truly desire Jesus? I mean, first and foremost, above every single thing else that there is or could possibly be. Or maybe you just have a preference for Jesus. You would prefer Him. How about how about a conviction, brothers and sisters? What about not a preference or not just a desire, but how about something so deep that you're convicted, drawn in such a way that the desire What about a conviction so strong that it becomes your passion? Your passion. Is that real love? Isn't it? When, you, when the desire becomes a conviction to become your passion? I mean, what do you talk about? What do you do? What's the center of your life? If somebody was to talk about you, what would they say? If you were drug into a courtroom, would there be enough evidence mounted against you to say that you truly desire Jesus? I'm just asking you to ask yourself that question. Brothers and sisters, we only receive, we only receive what we desire. Okay? That's all we're going to receive, is what we desire. Because if you don't desire something, you're not moving towards it. Amen? Let's turn our Bibles to Mark 11, 24. This isn't going to be a real difficult talk. This is going to be pretty simple. I mean, if I can understand this, you guys certainly can. Mark 11, 24. If you get there, just say amen. <laughs> Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye what? The Bible says desire. When ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall what? Ye shall have them. Amen. Do you think that Peter, James, and John desired Jesus? Okay. What about in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was fighting the hardest battle of his life. And he asked them to come a little bit further with him, right? And stay awake and pray, right? Pray that ye enter not into temptation. Do you think they desired? To do that? I think they did. They did. They fell asleep, didn't they? But they did desire Jesus, right? How much did they desire? How much do you desire? They were right there with him. And they knew there was something wrong with the master. 
and they fell asleep. Do you remember that these three also were on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Wasn't there a little sleepy time again that happened? Isn't God always trying to prepare us for something? Doesn't he, doesn't he test to get us in a place where we can be what he's looking for us to be, what he needs us to be, right? So back in the Mount of Transfiguration, these guys had their first test, their preparation work, stay awake, pray, what happens? They had the desire, but they fall asleep, right? What happens? Peter went, oh, wow, look what's going on here. Hey, let's build tabernacles, right? They desire. I think you're starting to get the point here. <laughs> but how much did they desire? I'm asking you today, brothers and sisters, to ask yourself, how much do you desire? Or do you just have a preference for Jesus? Do you truly have a conviction? Do you have a longing for Jesus? Does he really, truly burn in your heart? Is the question. The war, brothers and sisters, at its core is raging between desires. I want you to turn your Bibles to Galatians 5, 16. The war is raging between desires. When you get there, just say amen. Starting at 16, Galatians 5. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other, so that she cannot do the things that she would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? You, you, you hear the battle there for the desire? It's strong, isn't it? Does it ever wane, this battle? Not, not on this side of heaven, brothers and sisters, and I'm not so sure it ever will. Does God have the power to create? <laughs> Do you really believe that God has the power to create? <laughs> That's a little bit louder. Is God's arm too short to save? The Holy Spirit, my friends, is not just angry, but at war with sin and the flesh. Do you understand that? He is at absolute all-out war with sin and the flesh. The Holy Spirit has this victory made for us. He wants to give us this victory. But do we look for that victory? Do we desire Jesus enough to follow the Holy Spirit? Do you think this battle could be made much easier for us if we didn't fight it alone? Hmm. Let's turn our Bibles to Romans 8. Romans 8 and 32. He that spared not his own son, but, del but delivered him up for us all, 
how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Who is he that condemneth? What, what's being condemned here? Is God condemning man here? What's he condemning? Sin in the flesh. Right? How do we know that? How can we be sure? Let's turn our Bibles to John 3. I don't want anybody taking my word for anything. John 3. Everybody knows John 3.16, right? How many of y'all know John 3.17? Okay. Let's read it. For God sent not his son into the world to what? <laughs> to condemn the world, but what? <laughs> Might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that, be he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be removed. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you that Jesus Christ is mighty to save. Mighty to save. But he can't save anybody who doesn't desire to be saved. To call out to him. How can he hand the victory to somebody that doesn't even want it? You know, the hardest thing I have in driving, and I do a lot of driving, is, you know, I, I don't do it because it's the right thing. I, I mean, I think I do do it. I, I'm not, well, I should, I'm not sure. I'm going to have to whole table this for a minute while we discuss this, and I'll, I'll have the thought figured out when I get done. I generally let people out. I try to do the right thing. You know, I think I do it for the right reason. But it really upsets me just a wee little bit when somebody doesn't even acknowledge the fact that I've done something to try to, you know. Yeah, come on. I'm, you know, a hundred people have went by, and this one gal's trying to get out, and nobody lets her out. And I come up there, and I, come on. You know? And the person doesn't even smile at you, doesn't wave at you, does absolutely nothing. I would just assume they flip me off. <laughs> Something. No, I'm serious. I mean, this is what, I, I really, it's, it took me to that to understand what God is talking about, Laodicea, and their lukewarmness. That you don't even care. There isn't this desire, you know? I, you're not even there. You follow me? God says if you're hot or you're cold, I can work with you. If, you. if you're red hot on fire, that's love. I can deal with that. If you hate something, he can work with. But this dead, I don't even care. Wow. I understand why God hates that so much because I hate that. I really do. It drives me nuts. Desire, brothers and sisters, is what we're talking about today. Real hot desire. God wants us hot or cold. He wants us hot, but he can work with cold. I don't think he can work with dead. You follow me? All right. I want to read you guys something. Because... I can't say these things as well. But when I was studying this to, 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 to get this thing in here, I, I, I ran across these two little sentences 
that are so phenomenal and wonderful. I could read these two sentences to you. We can close the book and go home. All right? And this is from... Oh, what is it from? Councils for the Church, chapter 6, page 55. But this is actually just before... Just as soon as we realize our inability to do God's work and submit to... Did you hear that? Just as soon as we realize our inability to do God's work and submit to be guided by His wisdom, the Lord can work with us. If we will empty the soul of self... He will supply all our, necess our necessities. Is that powerful? Yes. Wow. That's two sentences. Two sentences. That's just beautiful. Anyways, here we go. Now I'm going to read you what I was wanting to read. You. Counsels to those who seek assurance of God's acceptance. How are you to know that you are accepted of God? Study his word prayerfully. Lay it not aside for any other book. This book convinces of sin. It plainly reveals the way of salvation. It brings to view a bright and glorious reward. It reveals to you a complete Savior. It teaches you that through his boundless mercy alone can you expect salvation. Do not neglect secret prayer, for it is the soul of religion. Wow. Did you hear that? Do not neglect secret prayer, for it is the soul of religion. With earnest, fervent prayer, plead for the purity of soul. Did you see purity of soul on your list of ten? I'm not, listen brothers and sisters, you grade yourself on your list of ten. It's between you and God. But he has something to say to you today and he has something to say to me. Plead as earnestly and as eagerly as you would for your mortal, as if your mortal life were at stake. Remain before God until utterly longings are begotten, are begotten within you for salvation. And the sweet evidence is obtained of pardoned sin. Praise the Lord. Can I get an amen? amen? Jesus has not left you to be amazed at the trials and difficulties you meet. He has told you all about them. He has told you also not to be cast down and oppressed when trials come. Look to Jesus, your Redeemer, and be cheerful and rejoice. The trials hardest to bear are those that come from our brothers, our own familiar friends. But even these trials may be borne with patience. Jesus is not lying in Joseph's new tomb. He has risen and has ascended to heaven that there, there to intercede in our behalf. We have a Savior who has loved us, that He died for us, that through Him we might have the hope and strength and courage and a place with Him upon the throne. He is able and willing to help you whenever you call upon His name. Do you feel your insufficiency for the position of trust that you occupy? Thank God for the more you feel your weakness, the more you will be inclined to seek for an helper. Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. James 4 8. Jesus wants you to be happy, to be cheerful. He wants you to do your best with the ability that God has given you. And then trust the Lord to help you and to raise up those who will be your helpers and carrying burdens. Is that amazing? Is that beautiful stuff? Do you believe it? Well, I hope so. Let's turn back to Romans again. We're not far from there, John. A little bit to the right, Romans 8.
8 and 26. And you're there to say amen. amen. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he...